Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for coming here, and, and thank you to those we couldn't accommodate wherever you are. We're, uh, we have an overflow uh, facility somewhere and a chance for people to access the program, but uh, uh, it, it, uh, it drew a full house, as you can see, and we're grateful to each of you. Uh, thanks. Uh, many of you have come to these uh, in, in the past, and uh, this series is, is meant to try to bring uh, interesting people and uh, noteworthy people and different ideas to Purdue University. Very uh, receptive to uh, any ideas any of you may have uh, when we res resume the series next year. And please just email them to me, and, uh, and uh, there's no one we won't ask and pursue aggressively. Um, if, uh, if a central uh, ambition of this little series has been to bring provocative thinkers and people who might offer uh, insights that are not common or that are, that are uh, uh, different than those we hear most of the time, then I think tonight we'll satisfy. Uh, our guest is uh, someone I have uh, admired a long time, uh, and I'm not alone in that. I had to write down some of the uh, rankings uh, in which he has recently appeared. Foreign Policy's Top 100 Global Thinkers, Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential uh, People in the World, Esquire's 75 Most Influential Thinkers of the 21st Century, the uh, UK Guardian's 50 People Who Could Save the Planet, and moving on down to more exclusive territory, his organization was found in the top 20 think tanks in the world among a universe of 7,000. Um, uh, but uh, still more exclusively, he is the one person that at least I can name who is, was able to gather over 100 of the world's top economists led by seven Nobel laureates uh, to assess uh, in, this, in this book, The Nobel Laureate's Guide to the Smartest Targets for the World uh, those things that might be done through collective action to make this a better and safer and, and a more uh, humane and sustainable planet. And uh, in so doing, he has brought some original insights and some challenges to conventional wisdom. And uh, that's the sort of thinking that uh, we appreciate the chance to listen to and perhaps challenge back uh, here at Purdue. So uh, with gratitude for all of you for coming, uh, let's express our uh, gratitude to tonight's guest, Bjorn Lomborg. Thanks a lot, Nick. All right, thank you. Thank you. So, so uh, Mitch to ask me, so we basically work on all the big problems in the world and how to fix them, and Mitch to ask me to basically do this in 25 minutes. Um, and of course you can do that. So I'm going to do three main points. First one is to recognize that things are generally getting better, not worse. That's crucial because that's the only way we can get out of this panic mode where we often are. It seems like everything is falling apart. If we can get to a point where we realize things are getting better, not worse, we can start asking rational questions. Where can we do the most good to make even better worlds for the future? I'm going to then talk about climate change, partly because this is probably where there's most of the interest here, and it's also one of the things that get a lot of people excited and interested in that kind of conversation. But it's also a great example of how we don't do the smartest things on climate, but how we could do it. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about all the other things uh, that you can do. And I'm also going to uh, show you a folder uh, that you can take when you leave. I don't want you to sit and read it now. Uh, but that can perhaps help and, and, and satisfy more curiosity. So first, things are getting better. Everybody believes things are getting worse. Let me just take the three main points that the UN talks about. So uh, welfare and economics and environment. And if you look at all three, uh, things have gotten better. If you look at uh, economy, we've seen since 1820 a dramatic decline of poverty. So basically, we started in a world where more than 90% of everyone was poor. Today, 
For the first time in 2015, we have less than 10% who are absolutely poor. That's a phenomenal outcome, and we should be very, very thankful for it. If you look likewise on society, on social benefits, we have a situation where we live longer and longer. Uh, we used to live about 30 years on average. Uh, today, we're about 70. So phenomenal out outcome. We basically have two lifetimes. That's an amazing achievement. And if you look at the, uh, the third one, environment, I want to just talk about it because you know, the, these are kind of obvious measures for economy and for society. But what's the obvious measure for environment? Well, that requires us to answer this other question. What's the deadliest environmental problem, or in some ways, the biggest environmental problem in the world? Almost everyone gets this wrong. People think it's water or it's climate change. It's none of the above. It's actually indoor air pollution. And a lot of people are like, what? What, what is that even? Yeah. It kills 4.3 million people. This is because about 3 billion, so 2.8 billion people, almost half the world's population, cook and keep warm with dirty fuels. Basically wood, carbon, uh, cardboard, dung, whatever they can get their hands on. That's how they cook and keep warm. And that means for 2.8 billion people, they have so much air pollution that the pollution inside these homes or huts or whatever they are, are typically 10 times more polluted than the outdoor air in Beijing. The World Health Organization estimates this is the equivalent for each one of these 2.8 billion people of smoking two packs of cigarette every day. The second one, second largest is outdoor air pollution, then lead, which is mostly a, a, a legacy issue, then water and sanitation, then ozone, then global warming and then uh, radon. And of course, people will then say, but global warming surely gets worse in the future. Yes, it does, but still uh, by 2050, this is World Health Organization, they estimate we'll see about 250,000 people die each year. So yes, it's a bigger problem, but it's important to keep the scale. So remember, indoor air pollution means this is how almost half the world's population live. As you can see, it's probably not a good thing to be inside that house, yet that's where three billion people live. And if you look at the air pollution, if you look at the outdoor, I'm not sure why my microphone does this, but it's not me. Um, <laughs> so if, if you look at the outdoor air pollution, this is the relative risk of dying each year per person in the world. Outdoor air pollution has been, been pretty constant. And of course, it covers up the fact that we've cleaned up, but at the same time, much of the developing world has gotten more polluted. But that's why, on a global level, it's been pretty uh, stable. But if you look at indoor air pollution, because we've gotten rich, we've seen a dramatic decline. So overall, we die a lot less from the world's by far biggest environmental problem. So overall, things have gotten better. We live longer, we have many fewer people who are uh, poor, and we have less of the world's biggest environmental problem. Of course, I'd love to go on, but I know that time is clicking, so I just wanted to show these three things. This is important, because if the world is getting better, and remember, this does not mean that there are no problems. There are lots of problems, and I'll get to those. But it means that we're moving in the right direction, then we can stop being scared, witless, and start talking about, so, of all these problems that remain, what should we do? And that's where I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about global warming. Uh, because it, in many ways, is the centerpiece for a lot of conversation in the rich world. I'll get to where it is for the rest of the world uh, afterwards. So fundamentally, global warming, yes, absolutely, it's a problem. Uh, it's real. It's significant negative impact. We estimate that the impact right now is probably about 0%. It's very little net impact on, on, on uh, if you measure it against GDP. But by the 2070s, the International Climate Panel, the IPCC, estimate that the cost will be somewhere between 0.2 and 2% of GDP. That's a real problem. That's a significant problem and something that we need to fix. Also, of course, remember, it's not 100%, uh, which we're sometimes led to believe. So yes, it's a problem we need to fix. Unfortunately, it's often dramatically exaggerated. Uh, notice how everyone talks about we're going to see more hurricanes, we're going to see more dr uh, dramatic uh, deaths and all kinds of stuff. Everything you see in the news can in some way or another be connected to global warming. Again, 
With 25 minutes, and I want to get to a lot of other problems, I can only give you a sketch of the argument. I'm sure we can have some conversation afterwards and some of the questions uh, on, on, on how this works. But this is Haiyan and, and uh, the Philippines, one of those very much talked about places where you had a hurricane come in and a lot of people died, about 5,000 people died, and it was really seen as a flashpoint for uh, C. We're going to see more and more of this. We're going to see more and more death of destruction because of global warming. But again, let's just remember, if you look at the numbers, these are the numbers from the International uh, Disaster Database for climate-related deaths. It has seen a dramatic decline since 1930. And so this is floods, drought, storms, wildfire, extreme temperatures. And again, look, you can have a conversation about what exactly the numbers are, how well are they, uh, how well are they measured, but fundamentally we've gone from a world where on average almost half a million people died each year uh, to much less than 50,000, and actually this decade is the lowest on record. This does not mean that global warming is not actually making this worse. That's possible. I, I, I don't think we have good, strong data for it, but it's possible. But the argument here is that many, many other factors are countering that. And so we're not heading towards a future where the world is just going to be one big death place. If anything, we're heading towards a place where we'll be much better off in the long run. So that means we need to start talking about why are we so bad at fixing global warming? We need to fix global warming, but fundamentally we get it wrong. A lot of people t tend to think, well, you know, if CO2 causes more warming, CO2 comes from fossil fuels, why don't we just stop using fossil fuels? It seems like an obvious thing, and a lot of campaigners will tell us that, but of course the problem is we don't burn fossil fuels to annoy Al Gore, right? <laughs> we burn fossil fuels because it basically powers everything we like about civilization. It gives us heat, cold, transport, food, electricity, everything we like. And so unless we can find a way to get all of this good stuff, but without the fossil fuels, and we still haven't found that, we're not in a place where we're going to be willing to give it up. And so just to give you a sense of proportion, this is from the International Energy Agency, so the OECD for energy. This is commonly regarded as the best uh, uh, estimate. This is their latest prognosis from late 2016. Uh, and they look to 2040, so basically a quarter of a century out. If you look at what is the energy consumption uh, over uh, a wide range of different things, so coal, oil, ga gas, nuclear, hydro, biomass, and so on, these are the things from the last uh, uh, number where we have, uh, the last year where we have numbers for the whole world. And basically, as you can see, it's coal, oil, and gas, and then a little bit of nuclear, and a, a little bit of hydro, and a lot of biomass. This, of course, is to a very large extent exactly what drives all the indoor air pollution. People believe that solar and wind is the future. But remember, wind makes up almost nothing. Wind makes up about 0.5% of global energy today, and solar makes nothing, 0.1%. You know, we believe that it's a huge number, and it's not. We're seeing a lot of these uh, 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 beautiful pictures of wind and solar, but it's, not, uh, it's a trivial matter right now. But then we also believe that certainly in a quarter of a century, it'll be a huge impact. No, it will not. And this is just a common, this is just a matter of, this is what the most respected uh, uh, institute is telling us what will happen over the next 25 years. This is assuming that we all do what we promised in Paris. So essentially the, the treaty that will solve global warming, I'll get back to how that's not true either. Uh, but let's just take a look. This is if everyone does all the stuff that we would like. This is what happens. We use more coal, we use more oil, we use more gas, more nuclear, more hydro, more biomass. Yes, more wind, and yes, more solar, but notice how small these numbers are. We go from 0.5 to 1.9 and 0.1 to 1.0. So we still have less than 3% of our energy in a quarter of a century from solar and wind. The only thing that drives renewable energy is, uh, is, uh, uh, is biomass, and then a little bit of hydro. So to put it differently, this is the graph for how much do we get of our energy in the world from renewables. Not surprisingly, when you think about it, from 1800, in 1800, we had 95% of our energy from renewables. We've been spending two centuries to get away from that. 
Now, of course, we're actually trying to turn it up. Notice we've been hovering at around 13% for the last 40 years. And so if everyone does what we promised in Paris, again, we'll see an increase. So we'll actually get up to 19% from 13.5 now. And more realistically, we'll probably get up to about 16%. But let's just get a sense of proportion. We are not anywhere close to solving this problem in the next quarter of a century. And solar and wind will play an almost trivial uh, part in this. It doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel nice. We would love the world to be different, but I think by telling ourselves stories that are not true, we're not actually helping the world. And also, we are not doing very good in our policies. So look, Rio, Kyoto, Paris, those kinds of treaties have done virtually nothing. I'm gonna show you something that you don't see very often, but I think everyone should see this. And it's gonna be a little complicated, but I think it's also incredibly uh, helpful. So if you look at the temperature impact of Paris, remember Paris was this treaty that everyone uh, agreed to, and Trump is threatening to throw, uh, you know, throw it out, but, but you know, fundamentally everybody agreed that we were gonna do something in Paris. And it was hailed as this, oh, we've solved kind of global warming. If you look at this, so I'm gonna show you over here how much CO2 we emit. And then I'm gonna show you over here well, I was hoping I'd show you over here, but maybe I will in just a second. So these are the historical emissions that we've seen from 2000 until 2015. Obviously, we don't know more than that. This is the business as usual scenario. So if we didn't do anything, and obviously there are lots of different business as usuals, this is the average of all the major uh, business as usual scenarios. Over here, you see the output of the, one of the main symbol UN climate models. So it's totally, totally uncontroversial. It's called MAGIC. It was partly funded uh, by the EPA. If you just plug this in, you get a sense of what is the temperature going to be. And you can see the temperature both in degrees centigrade and in degrees Fahrenheit over here. So basically, we're going to see a temperature increase by the end of the century by almost 4 degrees or uh, almost 7 degrees Fahrenheit. This is if we don't do anything. All right. So take a look. This is what happens if we do Keo uh, sorry Paris. And this is the official estimate from the UNF C, so the ones that organized uh, Paris for the UN, they estimate that we will cut this much. This is the promise if everyone does everything they promise. Of course, remember, this would be a first uh, in the world if we actually managed to do that. But let's assume that we do that. This is the Paris promise. We estimate that's 56 gigatons uh, 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 cumulative over the next 15 years. So I'm just going to put 56 uh, gigatons in there. If you run this in the model, this is the temperature outcome that you get. Oh, wait, you can't actually see the difference. Can you see there's a black line there? It's just, you know, uh, as Thomas Schelling, one of our Nobels, liked to point out, if you don't have a very, very fine pencil, he was a guy from back then, right? If you don't have a very fine pencil, you can't see the difference, right? The difference is 0 0.04 degrees or 0 0.07 degrees Fahrenheit. But you could imagine that not only are we promising this, remember, uh, Paris only goes to 2030, but if we assume that we're going to keep this promise all the way through the century, so basically this, that is Paris extended, and that gives us 540 gigatons of CO2 that we cut. Well, let's run that through the model. That gives us this graph. So we get a slightly thinner line. We actually reduce our temperature output by 0 0.18 degrees, or about 0 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit. Very little. You do get some, but very little. Now, this is not what you've heard, because what you've heard is that we're going to cut a lot more. This is what you know, the, the, the most quoted one, New York Times, a lot of other publications use this, it's called the Climate Action Tracker. They estimate that this is what will come out of Paris. Notice, not only are they assuming much, much more than what uh, the UN themselves think is the maximal output of the Paris Agreement, but they're also assuming that we'll just continue to dramatically reduce. This is about 3,000 gigatons of CO2. So they're assuming you know, basically 50 times more than what Paris has actually done. And that would give us a reduction in temperature of about 1.1 degrees, so a significant reduction. It would still be above 2 degrees, which is sort of the international climate target. And that's the last thing I just wanted to show you. This is what it takes to cut to get to 2 degrees, which is what everyone talks about. And remember, this is the 
higher end target of Paris. They actually talk about 1.5 degrees, and nobody has any idea of how we would get there. Uh, but this is the two degree target, and there's different ways you could get to it, but this is one of the accepted ones. This is the UN Environmental Protection, uh, uh, sorry, Environment Program, uh, their, uh, their estimate, and this reduces 6,000 gigatons. And then we actually stay, uh, you can see that up here, uh, then we stay below two degrees. So notice what we've talked about here. This is what the world has promised at very best. This was a world without Trump and all that other stuff. Then we would do this. And we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. This is the most ambitious one. And we can just tell the difference. This is what we mostly talk about. And this is what we've actually promised. So, and this is worth pondering. Just notice this, that the Paris Agreement is less than 1% of what it takes to just get to two degrees. So it's a little bit like going on a diet and then you know, eat the first salad and say, hey, done, right? <laughs> no. And this, of course, is phenomenally hard. This bit is phenomenally hard. This bit, I don't know how we're going to do that anytime soon. And quite frankly, very few people have any good sense of how we would do that because it's very costly. So, there, this is you know, just the subsidies that we're paying. Notice this is, again, uh, the latest IEA. Uh, right now, we're paying about $125 billion, and we're scheduled to pay another about $3,000 uh, billion over the next uh, 23 years. Right? So we're paying a huge amount of money. And remember, this is what's going to get us to the 3% solar and wind. And we're going to pay a lot more for the rest. Why is this? Well, cutting CO2 has real costs because Cheap and readily available energy gives you extra. So if you take the GDP growth out by this axis and uh, CO2 growth out that axis, there's a very strong correlation. And yes, you can have less CO2 growth, but you also get lower uh, GDP growth. That's the basic outcome of all these macroeconomic models. So when you promise to cut carbon emissions, it has a real cost. If you take a uh, look at the cost of Paris promises, and this is based on all the major energy economic models from Stanford, uh, typical reduction in GDP growth, uh, and I'm just going to show you very briefly for the US, again, if we actually did the Obama promise of cutting uh, 26, I'm only looking at the lower end, 26% and did it most effectively, it would cost $154 billion a year. That's not the end of the world by any means, but it's not a trivial cost. If the EU does what they're promised in the most effective policy, it would cost $305 billion, China $200 billion, Mexico $80 billion. Those are the only countries that we actually have good data for. And so I'm just going to estimate the rest, which is about 20%. So I'm just going to add up that and say that's 20% of the cost. And that leads you to a little less than a trillion dollars. I'm just going to say a trillion dollars for, 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 for ease of this. But of course, remember, this is if everyone does all the right things effectively. If there's anything we've known is that climate policies are phenomenally ineffective. So the European policies, for instance, we have very good data that shows that about twice as costly. And so the most likely policy is that all of these are going to be double. So we were talking about uh, almost $2 trillion. So a cost of $1 to $2 trillion per year for the rest of the century will buy you a reduction in temperature of something that's almost immeasurable. That's not a good way to help, right? So which climate policies do work? Well, we know a good recession is really great at cutting carbon emissions. Had the 2008 cr crisis been a little longer and been a little more expensive, we would actually have achieved the Kyoto Agreement uh, goals. Of course, most people don't actually get elected on that sort of thing. And if they, if they try, they will probably get booted out of office. So this is not a good way. But you know, it's important to recognize this is the main way that we know how to cut carbon emissions. If you look at what really works, well, the EU uh, wind and solar has cut about uh, 100 megatons of CO2 annually. If you look at US shale gas, and remember, these, these are hugely controversial numbers. They're order of magnitude, right? But there's no way that they're absolutely right. But order of magnitude, uh, US shale gas has probably caught about three times that amount. 
basically because shale gas has made it so cheap that you've basically stopped using a lot of coal-fired power plants and switched to gas. And that matters because gas emits about half the CO2 per energy unit produced. So remember, the EU pays $40 billion a year for its wind and solar, and you guys make about $300 billion a year from the shale uh, gas revolution. It's not hard to see what would you rather have, a rather ineffective policy that you have to pay a lot of money for, or a very effective effective policy that makes you a lot of money? This is not a hard question, right? But again, it's one of those things that has a huge contra controversy, but I think fundamentally we know that it's about getting shale gas out, getting China to switch to gas to a very large extent. That's the only way we're gonna manage to cut carbon emissions dramatically in the short run. But in the longer run, we need to invest a lot more in R&D. So we did a, a, a whole Copenhagen consensus on climate with 27 of the world's top climate economists and three Nobel laureates looking at what are the smartest ways to do this. Basically what they said was we need to invest a lot more in energy R&D, green energy. You know, basically make future green energy so cheap everyone will want to buy it also the Chinese and the Indians and everybody else. And that will only happen if you invest a lot more. This is one of the things that Bill Gates have been driving. Obama was also on the forefront of this. And so pretty much all nations have signed up to doubling it. We're saying we should increase it sixfold. Uh, and that would, unlike the present day policy, actually fix global warming in the long run because it would enable technologies with a very high percentage, obviously we can't guarantee, but with a very high percentage to actually fix it. And just to show you, we estimate the EU climate policy for every dollar spent will probably uh, do about three sets of avoided climate damage. So that's good, you know, you spend a dollar and you do some good, but not very much. Uh, but if you focused on green R&D, you could actually do $11 of good. You could do thousands of times better. So spend the money on green energy R&D. And this goes to show, and that's my third point, and then I'll shut up, um, or, or we'll have another fire alarm. Um, <laughs> So remember that there are many, many other problems in the world. Climate is one of them, and it is a legitimate problem that we need to fix. But there are many, many other problems like poverty, hunger, disease, and so on. Do you remember this? I showed you the biggest, the most deadly uh, 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 environmental problem in the world. Well, what's the most deadly problem in the world if we drop the environmental? That's poverty. Re notice how all of these suddenly became rather uh, you know, un unimportant global warming, of course, but even indoor air pollution, yes, because poverty, and this is very, very rude, uh, crude, uh, poverty probably kills about 18 million people each year, about a third of all that die in the world. So obviously poverty in many simple respects is the biggest environment, is, is the biggest problem in the world. Well, what is the big issues? What is it that we should focus on? Well, the UN actually, in its run up to uh, the uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, where they wanted to set new targets for the world uh, for 2016 to 2030, they went out and asked about, no, uh, about 10 million people what do you think are the most important issues? Remember, this is not a representative, so people have self-selected to do this, uh, but it's the biggest survey and it does accord very well to pretty much everything else that we've seen. And this is the UN's own survey. Uh, you can see the, uh, the, the link down there. You can no longer find it on the main pages of the UN because it didn't give the right answer. Uh, but this is what they said, you know, education is by far the most important than health, jobs, no corruption, nutrition, and those are the most important things, not surprisingly, right? And then no violence, clean water, support for people who can't work, better infrastructure, equality, reliable energy, no discrimination, political freedoms, protect forests, rivers, and ocean, phone and internet, and then action on climate. Action on climate came 16 of 16, and by a pretty far margin, right? And it probably wouldn't help much if it got just above phone and internet, right? The point here is to recognize that for most people in the world, they want you know, when my kids are dying, I'm poor, they don't get a good education, uh, they die like flies. Uh, obviously, those are the things that really matter. And so we gotta ask, what could we do? And that's what we've tried to do. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't also, you know, we're advanced civilization. We can chew gum and walk at the same time. We can also do something on climate. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't, that we should just neglect it, but it means that we need to recognize we can't just talk about climate change as if it's the only or the main thing that matters. There are many, many other things that matter. And so what we tried to do was to ask a lot of economists, we work with 82 uh, economists and several Nobel laureates, to look at where can you get the biggest bang for your buck? 
across all these areas. And I'm just going to share a few of them, and, and, and then you know, please feel free. You, I'm going to show, uh, you can get a folder with all of these, and I'd love to you know, invite you to take a look. We have much more on our website and all these people who've been uh, participating. So I'm giving it very short shrift. But basically, on climate and energy, we showed that there are some of these things that are not very effective. For instance, double renewable energy, uh, it'll probably cost about, so double uh, renewable energy, or really getting more energy to the poor in, in the world, would be a great thing, because they really need energy. So the benefits of getting them double the amount of renewable energy would probably be about $400 billion. The problem is, the cost of doing that would be about $500 billion. So spending $500 billion to do $400 billion worth of good is not a very good idea. And that's why we say the uh, benefit-cost ratio is 80 cents. You get 80 cents back in the dollar. Likewise, the two-degree target, probably not a good idea, as I also showed you. It's going to be phenomenally expensive or probably incredibly hard to do. But there are some other things to do. Climate adaptation, double energy efficiency, electricity to everyone will actually give you $5 back in the dollar. More energy research, as I just showed you, will do $15. Modern cooking fuels, so basically get rid of some of the indoor air pollution, is a phenomenal idea of $15. Phase out fossil fuel subsidies would be an incredibly good investment at more than $50. Uh, you know, uh, the, the biggest subsidy to fossil fuels is in Venezuela. Uh, well, right now, I'm not sure anyone really knows. But it used to be uh, that they subsidized at 92% uh, of, of the cost of gasoline. And, and the argument in most developing countries, remember, almost all fossil fuel subsidies are in developing countries. The argument is that it's for the poor. But of course, it's not, because you need a car in order to really enjoy the, the gasoline subsidy. So it's really a, a subsidy to middle class and higher incomes. And so you're basically spending, in Venezuela, you used to spend about 20% of your government budget on subsidizing gasoline. That's ridiculous. It leads to higher air pollution, more uh, you know, traffic jams, and it leads to worse outcomes in climate. And it's a really, really stupid way to spend money. So absolutely, get rid of fossil fuel subsidies. But remember, there's a lot of other things you can do. On infrastructure, for instance, get, uh, sorry, uh, get mobile broadband to developing countries. We estimate that it's going to be fairly expensive, but it's going to drive a little bit of economic growth. And that will probably mean for every dollar you spend, you'll do $17 of good. That's an amazing outcome. If you look at biodiversity, we find that there's a lot of things you can do in biodiversity that are actually pretty good, but the best thing is half coral reef loss. Again, notice we're not saying, you know, we're, we're not promising unicorns to everyone. We're not saying, let's get more of coral reefs or not let any, let any coral reefs disappear. We're simply having the somewhat depressing argument of saying half at least the loss of coral reefs over the next 15 years. But that turns out to be really cheap because a lot of the loss of coral reefs come from dynamite fishing and cyanide fishing bad ideas and very, very simple to teach people not to do, and then some of the cheap runoff problems from agriculture. If you do that, not only will you get better biodiversity, which is great, but you'll also, because the reefs act as hatchlings, you'll get higher fishery incomes for these people, and you'll get more tourism. So you'll get a, a triple win, and that's why we estimate for every dollar spent, you'll actually, if you evaluate all of this, you'll get about $24 worth of good. Food security and nutrition, reduced child malnutrition, is an incredible good, incredibly good investment. We estimate it gives you $45 back in the dollar. Because if you get better nutrition to small kids, zero to two year olds, not only that, is that morally right, it also turns out that it really helps their cognitive development. We know this for a fact from a lot of studies, but the best study, or, and also a little bit the scariest study, is one they did in Guatemala in the late 1960s when they went to two small rural villages in Guatemala and gave the kids there good food. Then they picked two other rural villages nearby, you can hear where this is going, right? And, and they gave the kids there bad food. Uh, that's, of course, a terrible thing. But our researchers have now gone back and refound those kids. They're now in their late 30s or early 40s. And the difference between having good food and not having good food is amazing. You have better marriages, you have better jobs, you have happier marriages, by the way. You have fewer kids. If you're a woman, you have fewer miscarriages. But crucially, your brain develops more. And so when you get into a school, which is often a crappy school, you learn more, you stay longer. So you learn more per year and you stay longer in school. And so when you come out, you're more productive. And so we estimate if you avoid being stunted, which is one of the best markers of uh, having been, mal been malnourished, you on average get 60% higher pay. 
So you're simply a much, much more productive member of society. That's why giving food to really small kids is a phenomenal investment. But that's not the only one. In health, there are lots of great interventions. Half malaria infections, $36. Cut tuberculosis death by 95%, $43. Immunization, we've, we've managed to immunize a lot of the world. We've gone from about 20% coverage to about 80%. But there's still more things that we can do. So the Global Alliance for Vaccines estimate if we spend about a billion dollars a year on extra vaccines, especially on, 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 on cutting down diarrhea, we could possibly save about a million kids each year. So every dollar spent would do about $60 of good. Now remember, this is not, some, this is not an investment guide. This is not money you can take home. Uh, that would be wonderful if it was. But this is how much good you can do. So this is, if you will, an ROI for philanthropy. This is where you should spend your money if you want to do good in the world. And then the top two things is gender, uh, universal access to contraception. 215 million women don't have access to contraception. If we gave them that access, not only would not 150,000 women die in childbirth every year, but they would also be able to better space their kids and that means they would be healthier, so fewer of them would die, so about 600,000 fewer kids would die each year. That gives you alone a benefit of about 40. But also, when you have fewer kids and they're better spaced, you have what we call a demographic dividend. You have fewer people in the, that are dependent, so you have fewer kids, you still have very old, few old people, so everyone is in the working age, so you get a higher growth rate, slightly higher, but because it drives over a generation, a generation and a half, you actually get about 80 more dollars back for that. So in total, every dollar spent will do 180, sorry, $120 uh, of social good. And the best thing is uh, 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 basically get more free trade. Yes, you have to pay off, especially uh, agricultural interests, but the benefit would be phenomenal. You'd simply make the world much, much better off. You'd actually be able to make the, in every person in the developing world about $1,000 richer. You'd be able to pull about 160 million more people out of poverty. And for very little money, basically paying off the people who are against free trade, which now is also Trump, but used to be mostly uh, 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 farmers. So the fundamental point here is to say, yes, there are smart things to do in climate, and there are smart things to do in all these other areas. And so what I would love to engage you in and what we'll have a, have a chat about now is really just, look, the world is not going to hell in a hand, a hand cart? What is the expression? <laughs> God, you guys said it all at the same time, so I couldn't hear, but, but you know what I mean. So it's not going in the wrong direction. It's generally going in the right direction. That doesn't mean that there are no problems. There are lots of problems still, and we've, I've noticed some of them, but let's focus on where we can do the smartest things. So when it comes to climate, you know, please focus on phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, get more energy research, get electricity to everyone, some of those things that would do an amazing amount of good and stop doing the stuff that doesn't do very much. And also remember there are lots of other stuff. And actually, I'm just, I'll just show you a little bit of it. So this is all the stuff that we've looked at, uh, and I'm not going to go through it. But you can get, we have a book, we have a long book coming out with Cambridge University Press, but this is the one that we give to politicians because it's just one page. Um, <laughs> And this has all the research in here, and I hope you'll find it interesting and stimulating. And, and the amazing thing is, uh, I, I also gave this to Mike Bloomberg. He, uh, uh, he was late for my talk, and so I said, did you get this? And he was like, oh yeah, I already got it. I went through and I pencil in where we spend all our money, and I, I sent it back to my research department and said, why aren't we spending more in the long lines? I was like, yes. Right, so that's exactly the conversation I would like. Thank you. If you even knew this, until he tripped over uh, hell in a handbasket, you might have forgotten that his English is so perfect, you might have forgotten he's Danish. I was going to have him give the talk in Danish, but then only I would have understood him. And so uh, he was gracious enough to switch to his second or third or could be eighth language. I'm not sure. How many? I do four, but this is definitely my second. All right. Um, so I think if... Uh, by your leave, uh, we're already past the appointed hour, but you're here, thank you. And uh, we uh, will go straight to the questions from our students. Some of our faculty have chosen some of our students uh, to ask uh, whatever questions they have formulated. So let's, let's do that. And I think we'll run a, another 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have captured the full hour. If that sounds all right, I hope we'll not uh, invade anybody's dinner hour. So um, 
Uh, let's, uh, Mark, why don't you go first? Is this on? Everyone here? All right. So I'm Mark G. I'm a student in College of Agriculture. Looking at the long lines that you put up there, there's quite a long line next to free trade, but the world hasn't adopted it yet. That might imply there are some hidden costs not included in your calculations. I was wondering if you could talk about what some of those might be. Yes. So, so I, I would probably tend to say it, it could be that there are hidden costs. It could also just simply be that some of these things are really hard to do politically because there are some very strong interest groups that are that are blocking it. I would probably tend to be more in favor of that. But 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 absolutely, their their cost to free trade. So their cost uh, environmentally. You know, the more free trade you have, the more pollution you're going to have, the more transport you're going to have. We try to take that into account. So one of the important things to re recognize is when you try to get you know, 82 uh, researchers from a lot of different disciplines, notice they're all economists, but they're still you know, from very, very different disciplines. They measure costs and benefits in many different ways, typically as their literature tends to do. That means they measure some things and they leave off other things. We try to get them to do all of these things. They don't do all of them. And some of the things that they then bring back in, we at least try to get them to give a sense of, of, of magnitude. So there's no way you could sort of derail this, uh, this outcome on, 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 uh, on free trade, even if there was some you know, significant things that we'd left off. But one thing that we do need to talk about is there's no, uh, uh, there's no distribution in there. So we're all about efficiency. Efficiency is good, but it's only one part of the answer. And very clearly, you know, some of the things that a lot of people who feel very uncomfortable about uh, free trade today is about distribution, that some people actually get left in the, in the lurch. They, they don't get uh, the, the benefit of, of, of more free trade. And that's not something that you know, economists have a good answer to. So again, I, I, I should warn you, when we, when we put up this list of priorities, we're basically informing you, you know, what works and what works phenomenally. But it doesn't mean that that's how you should pick. You shouldn't just put it in an Excel sheet and click sort, and then we've done what the world should do. Think of it as a, as a menu for the world. You know, you get a menu, you get a lot of different options, you get some prices and sizes, you get a sense of what works. But it doesn't mean you pick that, right? We'd be the kind of guys that, that if you were looking at your menu, we'd say, you know what? Spinach is really cheap and it's good for you. So you should buy more of that. But you know, you might end up going with a caviar instead. Right? You're in a, a, what might be a, uh, a necessary clarification for some, and it was implicit when you talked about the ROI on philan uh, philanthropic ROI and so forth. But as the book makes plain, you're economists, but these are not purely financial calculations you're making. You're, me you're measuring social, yes. somebody is making a, a, an, a, a, some calculations of social benefit as well as and directly financial. Yeah. Sorry, yes, that's very, very important. We're not just talking about financial benefits. We're also talking about social benefits and environmental benefits. So, you know, we're both measuring how much higher economic outcome will you have, how many fewer people will die, and how many more wetlands will you have, sort of thing. Uh, so we try to estimate all of it, but make it in one dollar estimate. Yeah. Samantha. Hi, my name is Samantha Lete. I'm a senior in the College of Science. Uh, my question is, we've seen over the past year or so that in this election and political climate that facts aren't always facts. And it's difficult when people are educated at different levels. Obviously, a lot of us sitting in this room have been lucky enough to be in this higher education setting, but not everyone is like that. And often these goals that you're saying you want to accomplish are being held back by people who may not have the access to the same education or see the world in the same way. How do you um, think is the best way to act upon this disparity in education and how we can all kind of come together to see the same facts and not different facts, which shouldn't be different. They should all be the same. But, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I, I think we, we have to be careful not because you know, uh, probably almost everyone in here are very well educated, so we think that we're really smart, right? But there, you know, a lot of people who are not all that well educated have good reasons for a lot of the things that they talk about. So some of the things that we talk about as, as dispute and facts is really dispute on, on policy and you know, impact. So when we talk about you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people with low income who works in in uh, in sectors that are you know, that are subject to to tr that that are basically challenged by trade will possibly say no we shouldn't have this although for poor people in general free trade is a great thing it's not for everyone and so so i think we ha we have to be careful about this so i my my sense is again when when we try to present this 
and try to present, look, there's these you know, 76 different things you can do. Some of them are incredibly good, some of them are not. I would love to have a world where people would just be like, you know what, you sound smart, we're gonna do all of that. Uh, but you know, but that, that's just not how the world works, right? Uh, at best, we might be able to slightly sway a few people because they already have interest in some of these long lines, right? And that's exactly how it works. You know, people whose outcomes are at the top of the list think we're amazingly smart. And people who have things that are towards the bottom of the list think we're idiots. And that's fine, you know, because essentially we make it a little easier for the people with smart ideas to argue for theirs and a little harder for, 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 the, for, the, low, for the low outcome. So the way we see it, we, we provide sort of tailwind to the good ideas and headwind to the bad ones. And that probably means that we make a tiny change in how the world spends its money. And that's all you can do with information. I think a lot of this comes down to policy, but if we can you know, change it a little bit, we've certainly done well. So you know, the way I see this, it's, it's about making the world slightly less wrong. You got a chance to move a little money. You told me uh, in a, a month or so, you're gonna be visiting with a rather interesting group uh, who's gonna hear this message. Yeah, so, oh, so actually two things, because that's, that's in two months. Uh, but in one month, we're doing this for Haiti. Uh, and so we're, we're meeting with the president and with the, uh, the finance minister and everybody else in Haiti talking about specifically for Haiti with ha Haitian researchers, where can you spend money? But of course also with USAID and all the others that are spending money in Haiti and trying to see if there's a smarter way to spend that money. And again, there'll be lots of political reasons why they're not gonna listen to all of these outcomes, but some of them will. And we've done this in Bangladesh and actually you know, the finance minister loves some of the things that we proposed because it gets some extra revenue. You know, there's lots of you know, possibly slightly wrong reasons for why they do the right things, but that's fine. You know, so our goal is simply, if we can change it a little bit, and so yes, the, the thing you were alluding to, we're uh, meeting up with the, uh, the giving pledgers, so you know, the Bill Gates uh, that promised to give at least half their, uh, their, their money uh, away in their lifetime that, that are billionaires. Uh, and you know, basically, I'm gonna try and tell them, you know, Try and pick the long lines, you know. That, and, and, you know, they'll do some of that and some of it won't, won't, won't happen. And again, remember, uh, yes, they have lots and lots of money, but it's trivial money compared to how much money uh, governments spend around the world. So our prime interest is really in getting governments to change. And that's about getting all of you and everybody else convinced that they're actually smart and, and less smart policies out there. And let's focus a little more on the smart ones. Nick. Hi, I'm Nick. I'm a senior in the College of Science. Uh, what are your thoughts on spending money on something like, oh, your thoughts on spending money on something like space exp exploration rather than directly on researching alternative energy sources in the hopes that uh, by, by way of re researching something else you see benefits in other fields? Well, I, I think there's a general argument uh, for spending money on, on general R&D uh, because we seem to have found that in a lot of other areas, we just end up making discoveries that we never thought were possible and that was probably a good idea. I think we should also be careful not to think about everything in a cost benefit term, you know, sort of like, so what's the benefit cost ratio of this opera sort of thing? Uh, and, and, you know, it's fine to say that we're just spending money because we thought it would be fun or it'd be beautiful or something like that. Uh, so, so, uh, I think I'm, I'm looking at the sort of efficient part of government, you know, the, or the thing that would, you know, presumably try to be efficient. So did maybe the, the 80% or something. Yes. Uh -huh. I thought you did. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the thing that implements, uh, you know, uh, 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 certainly, f uh, you know, f fire, fire squads and military and build roads and, and tries to do uh, uh, education and all those kinds of things, where it's kind of clear that you have an output in mind. Uh, and that you would like to find a way to make more output for less money, if you could do so. Uh, and then there's also some things that have, you know, little obvious value, but just, you know, we want to do for, for a variety of other uh, reasons. And I think that's, that's fine. So, you know, I, but, but again, uh, so we're just doing a, an analysis for DFID, the, uh, the USAID in, in Britain. They have decided to spend five billion pounds on research and development into uh, developing country uh, uh, problems. And, and you know, this probably shouldn't leave the room, but it probably will. And it's no big secret. But, but uh, 
I, I don't think anyone really knows what that means or what, how they're going to spend that. And the real worry is that because the universities have starved, they're basically just going to say, yeah, we'll take that and just use this as, as our re regular uh, uh, your revenue. I, I don't know if you can recognize that sort of thinking. But, but, <laughs> but you know, fu fundamentally, so, so what we're trying to do is to make a basic case for what's the benefit cost ratio for a lot of different R&D. And there hasn't been a lot of, of studies on R&D, but in general, the sense seems to be that there's a very, very large social benefit. Why? Because private companies systematically underinvest in long-term R&D. Why? Because it's really hard to recapture that gain. If you make up something that's phenomenally useful in 50 years, say you invent the laser, right? You can't make money off of it because by the time it actually becomes something you can use, it's gone out of, you know, your patent has run out. And so companies dramatically underinvest in long-term uh, uh, R&D. That's why we need to have universities and other places where you invest in this because the social benefits of us discovering new knowledge is incredibly large. Aaron Paul. Hi, I'm Erin. I'm a sophomore in the College of Science. So you discussed the importance of food security and growing up with access to good food. Uh, from an economic perspective, how important do you think GMOs are? Do you think they're our best solution to solving this problem? So, so GMO is one of those funny things, right, where, where people get very, very upset. Uh, and, and I've always found it, you know, so, so if, you, if you talk to most people, you know, if you look at, at uh, um, what is Pew, uh, 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 did a study of, of uh, what a lot of scientists believe. You know, they looked at vaccination. Yes, all scientists tell you that it's not dangerous, that you should have your kids vaccinated. They looked at climate change. Yes, all experts pretty much say it's a real issue and you should do something about it. And they looked at GMO, and yes, all scientists, almost all scientists said it's not dangerous. And I, you know, I th I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a natural scientist, so you know, I, I basically listen to all of these guys. I think it's, uh, it's very clear that it's not a hugely dangerous thing. It doesn't mean we shouldn't you know, regulate it, and I think we have, uh, if anything, certainly regulated it very well. You could also argue that we've over-regulated it. I think also if you look at the impact so far, you know, for instance, look at uh, golden rice, uh, which was this promise that we would be able to you know, feed kids uh, with lots of vitamin A. Vitamin A, you know, basically lack of vitamin A kills about half a million kids every year. So it would have been a huge help. Uh, but it's certainly been lacking behind its promise. So I think it may have been somewhat oversold. Uh, I, th I think it has great potential, uh, but I think we also need to be careful not to oversell uh, some of these things because then we end up in a situation where people feel a little cheated. Uh, on, 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 on some of these things. But I think you know, the, the fundamental answer is you know, if, if, if people, and, and it's often the same people who are very worried about global warming who are also very worried about GMO. You know, if you're very worried about global warming because most scientists tell you this is actually a real problem, then you should not be worried about GMOs because most scientists tell you it's not a big problem. How about Adam? Hello, I'm Adam and I'm a senior in the College of Science. And so my question is a little bit more on the environmental side of things. Um, so there are certain countries in Europe, and the one that pops to mind is Germany, who are promising by like, you know, 2050, they're gonna switch everything over to renewable um, energy, right? And it's costing them a whole lot. So do you think that this is worthwhile? Should they be spending all that money on something else? And if that is, uh, which of those things do you think would be the best um, investment? Yeah. So I, I think there's a couple of, of things to uh, uh, realize. Almost all of these promises, have you ever noticed how almost all politicians promise stuff that's only gonna happen when they're dead? Uh, you know, that's, that's incredibly convenient, right? Uh, because, you know, everyone can promise something in 2050. Uh, if, you guys will probably have to be careful about that, right? But, but, you know, the rest of us can just, you know, promise away. Uh, and and, and so, so it's not gonna happen uh, by any means at the current rate and at the way that Germany is doing it. So Germany has, to a very large extent, said, we're going to have this in a given, so the energy change, where we're basically going to go for solar and wind. Uh, and, and, you know, solar and wind makes up a fairly trivial part. Uh, so uh, Germany still gets 81% of its energy from fossil fuels. And, of course, then at the same time, they made the phenomenally stupid decision of saying we're going to get rid of nuclear power. Now, you can have a lot of different conversations about nuclear power. My, my sense t tend to be that nuclear power, no, it's not dangerous, 
but it's, it's not economically efficient in the current form. We know that most, you know, most nuclear power costs a lot. There's a huge cleanup cost at the end, so the actual cost of producing a kilowatt hour is actually fairly high. That's, that's why I'm sort of reserved against nuclear power. But remember, that was not the conversation that the Germans had. They'd already built the nuclear power plants. So they already committed to cleaning them up. So basically, while they're just running, they're producing incredibly cheap energy, entirely clean. And what did the Germans say? They said, let's get rid of that. You know, let's make sure we need to have the cleanup cost right now instead of in 40 years, and let's get rid of all the clean energy that we could have produced very, very cheaply. That is just, you know, triple stupid. Uh, and I think you know, pretty much everyone knows it. I mean, the real reason why they did it was political reasons, right? Uh, and that goes back to your question on free trade. You know, there's a lot of other things that, that play in here at, at the same time. Wasn't it so, the Germans that gave us that brilliant diesel decision? Yes, that, that's, a, that's another. First and, they subsidized, then it jacked up air pollution to yes, ridiculous yes, levels. Now they're yes. trying to pay people to take the diesels off the roads. Yes, yes. And it is a good ex example of, of just focusing on one thing, uh, that you focus on CO2 where diesel is more effective and you didn't focus on, 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 uh, on air pollution, which was actually much worse for uh, diesel. To, to these guys' uh, defense, you also have to say that you know, they were helped by a lot of mendacious companies that told them, oh yes, it actually is right. possible and they're not polluting very much except out in reality. How about Michaela? Hi, I'm Michaela Vogue, and I'm a junior in the College of Science. Thank you for your talk. It's all been really interesting, and I know that you've received a lot of criticism for your work. How has this influenced your actions and views, and has this hurt or helped you? Yeah. So uh, yes, there's a lot of people who are critical, and, and I, I, I think this is you know this is entirely fine. Um, uh, it, <laughs> In some ways, if, 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 nobody, you know, if nobody's paying attention, it's probably because you're not saying something that's very interesting. I mean, you can say something that's outrageous and, and still be wrong, right? Uh, but, but, I, but I think in some ways, uh, uh, you know, when, when I first got started on this, I had a totally different research agenda. I was actually doing uh, computer simulation and game theory. So, you know, something that like 100 people in the world would appreciate. Um, uh, so, I, but I had this, plan, and I, I still have, you know, I think uh, university can be a little boring. Uh, you know, you, you sort of expect to come in and, and experience Plato and Aristotle, and, you know, you get, uh, like, these multiple choice tests instead. Um, and so I, I wanted to, you know, make it more exciting in my, uh, in my home uh, uh, college in Aarhus in Denmark. Uh, and so I got students in, in, in a lot of different uh, uh, areas, and I wanted them uh, to do interesting stuff. And so what is essentially what I presented you here is some of the stuff that we started out doing. And you know, we were just like, really, is the numbers this different? Is it, you know, is it all air pollution and indoor air pollution? All that stuff, you know, sort of realizing, wow. And then we wrote up stories. We thought this was important to share with people. And then a lot of people got very upset that how dare you say that my thing is not the most important thing in the world. Uh, and, and I've always taken great comfort in, I don't know, I've been told that this is a standard saying at Harvard Law School, but I'm sure it's you know, something that they say a lot of places. You know, if you have a good case, you should pound the case. And if you have a bad case, you should pound the table. Uh, and, and, and so I, I find that a lot of the criticism mm -hmm. that I get is really pounding the table. And in some sense, I find that very reassuring. Uh, but but you know if 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 people have and I'm you know I'm I'm happy to also have those questions you know if if there are real you know disputes that's absolutely what we should have a conversation on and I've I don't think I've ever shied away from this but I also I I think you know fundamentally it's incredibly important that we have someone who also dare to say look this is not how most of the world's people think you know the the uh, the. The uh, priority list that I showed you from 9.7 million people, it's probably, re we, we have some surveys that are reasonably representative, and this is probably pretty much how most of the people in the world think. You know, it's about food, it's about health care, it's about education, it's about jobs, it's about nutrition. Uh, those are the things that really matter to most people. And yet, if you read the papers, they're almost nowhere to be found. And so, you know, I try to give a voice to that. I try to give a voice to a lot of smart solutions. And yes, some people are going to get annoyed. Um, 
I, I was at a meeting earlier today uh, where, where you know, uh, one of the women who were there, there she, was, she was, you know, a little miffed that the thing that she was doing was not, you know, is actually pretty far down uh, towards the bottom of the list. And I totally understand that. You know, that, that, that would be upsetting to anyone. But somebody needs to point that out. <laughs> Uh, because otherwise we'll just end up, you know, doing equally all of these, th all of these things. And, and so, you know, I, I, I actually, uh, uh, when Mitchell, he was the new development minister in Britain when Cameron first came in in 2010, um, they were very eager to do exactly what we were doing for the USAID in, in Britain. Uh, so this was a great opportunity. Everybody wanted to do it. Everybody thought this was a great idea. How could you not want to spend more money on doing the most good you could... Uh, until it's, it started dawning on everyone that, wait a minute, I have, you know, I have a mortgage, I have two kids I need to put through college. What if they figure out that the stuff I do is not the most effective way to spend money? That's no good, right? So suddenly everybody realized, oh, no, 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 let's not do that. Let's do an internal survey. So they basically booted us and they did an internal survey and they came out and said, everybody is doing sterling work. <laughs> you know, I think we can, I think we can appreciate the you know, the conviction and, and the, uh, e even now and then, the, the uh, sanctimony of people who are passionate about a given cause. But they, sooner or later, work like yours confronts uh, us with the reality that resources being finite, if you misspend a dollar on something that doesn't do much good, you have foregone an opportunity to do a ton of good. You may have cost someone their life. And that's not a very moral position to take. So making smart decisions is, to my way of thinking, uh, has implications um, that are uh, beyond simple wisdom. Yep. We've got a little bit of time and two or three questions left, and we have a statistician on the panel who I believe is Margaret. Hi, my name is Margaret, and I'm a junior in the College of Science. You've discussed some of the world's largest problems tonight, and nearly all of them will be affected by the political system before change is enacted. How do you think corruption will, will affect your models, and how do you suggest we combat it? So corruption is a huge problem. We work with Susan Rose Ackerman, who's a, an economist at Yale University. She was the originator uh, that corruption probably cost the world about a trillion dollars a year. So it's a huge problem. Um, unfortunately, uh, the standard saying is huge problem, no good solutions. And so we're all about good solutions. And so if there's no good solution, you know, focus on something else. Uh, you know, don't try to fix stuff that's really hard to do when there's a lot of stuff that's really, really easy uh, to do. But it actually turned out, and one of the things we found in Bangladesh, I was very, very excited about that, was we found a good solution to one part of corruption. Uh, so a very large part of spending in developing countries goes to uh, procurement, and almost all of that goes to uh, infrastructure. So it's almost half the public budgets in developing countries. It's about $880 billion globally in, in the developing world. And it's obviously hugely corrupt. In Bangladesh, uh, you have to hand in, this is old British legislation, you have to hand in a sealed envelope in a particular government office for a particular bid. And then they'll decide and you know, probably find the one that's the cheapest. But of course the problem with that is that the ruling families in, those lo in that local area have already decided that you're going to get the bid. And so what they do is they put up goons outside that office. So you physically can't get in with your envelope. And so, you know, you get the bid, but you know, we all end up paying. Uh, more. So we had a researcher do two years. They, they convinced Bangladesh to change 4% of their procurement spending and do it on e-procurement instead. So essentially eBay for procurement. So you could do this from all over uh, 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 Bangladesh. So you get better offers. You get many more offers, typically also higher quality. But it also becomes a lot harder to you know, manipulate. Now, it doesn't become Im impossible. I'm sure there's still corruption. But what we found was there's 12% less corruption, or what's the equivalent of $700 million <coughs> almost for free. So you have to have some computers, you have to have computer software, and you have to re-educate about 115,000 uh, Bangladeshi employees. Cheap, cheap, cheap compared to $700 million per year, which is why, I, as I mentioned, the finance minister loved this because you know, that's basically $700 million for free. So they are instituting that now in Bangladesh. Uh, so basically, we found a very cheap way to get more money uh, or to get more, uh, more government services almost for free. 
So there are solutions. There are not a lot of good solutions. I should just mention all the stuff that you saw up here that we've analyzed take into account a standard amount of corruption. So we're not being idealist. We're saying if you spend a dollar, for instance, in tuberculosis, some of that medication is going to go awry, both because of, of corruption, because of incompetence, because people don't want to keep taking the medication when they get uh, well. You know, you know that when you get you know, your penicillin, penicillin from your doctor, you don't take the last pills. That's a big problem in the developed world. If you have to do this for half a year uh, or a year, as you have to do uh, with tuberculosis, it's really hard to get people to do it. And so a lot of people stop doing it. We take all of that into account, and yet there's a huge benefit. So we assume all the standard uh, corruption uh, in there. If you find a better way to, corrupt, uh, to, to clear up corruption, you know, we're going to listen to you and we're going to make uh, updates in 2020 on what's the smartest target. So you know, anyone who has good ideas, you know, please get it into the period literature and it'll be part of the, of the next update to what should the world be focusing on. Ben. Uh, my name is Ben Callas. I'm also in the College of Science. I'm a senior. And my question kind of pertains to a lot of what we talked about, which is the benefit per dollar spent. And one of these you mentioned in one of your papers was malaria versus HIV. So for malaria, you estimated about $1,000 per life saved, whereas HIV was about 10000 And on your chart, it showed up as uh, HIV was more yellow as opposed to malaria green. At what point do you propose that we remedy a massive problem like HIV AIDS? Yes. So, so just great, Ben, and, and just to give the background, uh, it's, it's much cheaper to save a malaria uh, 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 incidence than an HIV incidence. And it's basically because malaria medication is much cheaper and you just need it for a couple of weeks, whereas HIV medication is more expensive and you need it for life. This is incredibly uncomfortable to talk about, right? Because we really want to save both. Uh, depending a little bit, the, the, the stuff we have up there is not saving everyone from HIV, but only the high, uh, uh, high incident HIV countries. And because high incident countries are better uh, per dollar spent because you actually save more people because they are not going to reinfect other people, that turns out to be a little more effective than the other numbers that you were, uh, that you were suggesting. But very roughly, you can save 10 people from malaria every time you can save one person from HIV. We don't like to hear that because we want to save both all the people with HIV and all the people with malaria. But the problem is we don't. There's 600,000 people that will die this year from malaria. There is 1.4 million people that will die from HIV this year. We don't save these people. And so the simple problem that I sort of confront people with is to say, well, if you would like to save 10 people or one first with the amount of money that you're going to spend on, on medication. And my simple answer is you should save 10 lives before you save one. That means leaving people dying from HIV. That does not feel good. But remember, most people's way out of this is to say, well, you know, here is 10 people that are dying from ma malaria. Here's one guy uh, dying from HIV. Which would you pick? They'll say both. <laughs> but of course, that's just copying out of the, 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 the argument. So, okay, so you just came up with twice the amount of money that we had. But you're spending it on one guy, whereas you could have found 10 other people that have malaria and saved them. So you're basically deciding to not save nine more lives. And you know, there's no way out of this moral dilemma. We don't confront it, and typically we don't talk about it. And that goes back to your question on you know, uh, how do I feel about being the, the annoying guy that points out stuff we don't. This is the kind of thing you shouldn't mention at any cocktail party, right? Because <laughs> nothing good will ever come of that. But we should, because not talking about it doesn't make that choice go away. It simply means, and this is how we typically solve it, we spend some on HIV and some on malaria. And that's not a good answer. Um, now, I would argue that there was probably a lot of other places where we spend money uh, at development at very low benefit, and we should probably cut that, and then we could probably save both malaria and HIV. But remember, that's also a little bit of a cop-out, because until we actually do that, we should spend most of it, not all of it, but most of it on malaria. Will, you get the last word. Hello, my name is Will. I'm a sophomore in the College of Engineer. Excuse me, College of Agriculture and College of Science. Um, I was curious about. I don't know how I got College of Engineering out of that, but uh, long day. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Will? Anywho, I was curious about um, if we invest in the issues discussed in your cost-benefit analysis, would that be treating the surface level issue, considering that climate change is often closely linked um, to these other factors, would investing in climate change have a hidden monetary benefit that we're not seeing right now? It's a, it's a very good question. Uh, so, so in principle, we should have taken that into account. So when you look at most of the benefits that stem from doing something about climate, those benefits we estimate with integrated models that basically try to look at you know, what are the reduction in people that are going to be influenced by storms and what are the reduction in, in sea level loss, uh, sorry, sea level rise and hence loss of, 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 of coastal land area and you know, uh, how, how many more you know, drought incidents will we avoid and all that kind of stuff. So they've really done a good job on, on looking across all these areas. And actually, if you look, for instance, on, 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 you know, we were just talking about HIV and malaria, these are typically health economists. They don't look 100 years into the world. They don't look at a lot of other things. They just look at the dead people. Uh, so, you know, uh, so they typically just look at 10 years of dead people from HIV or dead people from malaria. And they say, see, there's a huge problem here. We should do something about it. So in some ways, you could probably say our malaria and our HIV estimates are underestimated compared to climate because climate has pretty much everything incorporated, whereas malaria and, uh, and HIV only has the next 10 years of death. But of course, there's a lot of other things that happen. First of all, you know, if, if your parents die from HIV, you probably are screwed in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of you know, fallout both in, you know, in, in more crime rates, there's a lot of uh, a problem in productivity, uh, of, of loss of continuity in many companies. For instance, malaria, because malaria is so pervasive. Most people, the, the, a large part of the problem with malaria is actually not that you die, but it is that you're repeatedly sick. So in many countries, you have two people working one person's job because at any one time, one of them will be sick with malaria, which of course is terrible for productivity. So a lot of these things are not actually in the models and would increase uh, the benefits there. So if anything, we're probably a little good towards climate compared to the others. But your, your main point is well taken. Remember, a lot of people will say, if you do something about climate, not only will you avoid you know, higher temperature rises, but you'll also avoid more you know, malaria, for instance. I think that's a slightly tenuous, but let's just go with it and say you know, if there's higher temperatures, you'll have more malaria because there's more places where the mosquito will survive. And so if you reduce the temperature increase, you'll probably have slightly less malaria. That's you know, our, uh, certainly on the margin, it's, it's probably true, but it's probably a fairly small uh, benefit. But so the argument is if you invest in climate, you also get benefits in malaria. But remember, if you invest in malaria, you also get benefits from climate. Because why? If you make people less dying from malaria, if they are less sick, they get more productive, so they are less vulnerable to a lot of other things like climate change, but of course also all other things. We know typically that rich people are much, much less vulnerable. You know, the simple way to look at that is what happens when a hurricane hits, you know, Guatemala, lots of people die, you know, the infrastructure is wiped out. What happens if a hurricane hits Florida? Yes, it's costly, but you know, very few people die and they're back pretty much to normal after a couple of weeks. So fundamentally, if you're rich, you're robust towards a lot of other things. So I think we often focus on the idea of saying, if you do something about climate, you get other benefits. Those are, in we, we've incorporated those in the answers. But likewise, if you get rid of, for instance, malaria or some of these other things, you make people richer, you make them more robust, so they're better able to deal with, uh, with climate change and better able to deal with all the other horrible stuff that will happen or can happen to them. So, so Bjorn, yes, we take into account all these things, and, and, and I think, if anything, we've probably done it in, in a way that, uh, that overemphasizes climate, not underemphasize it. So Will's question and your answer prompts me to ask this last thing. The book points out that seven times more people die from cold than heat. Yes. Now, there wasn't a bar for cold. I saw, I saw a bar for, it said warming. Yes. Uh, there wasn't a bar for cold. Why not? Well, so uh, it's important to recognize that when we talk about global warming, uh, there's a tendency to focus on all the bad things that will happen with global warming. I don't know if you know, uh, back in the 70s, some people uh, worried a lot about global cooling. Now, this is not actually a big trend or anything. I'm not making that argument, but I'm simply pointing out that you know, a significant number of people in you know, New York Times and many others wrote about this that probably is not a good 
idea if it gets really cold, which is probably true. Uh, but I'm always curious about, you know, people were saying, well, we'll actually have lower productivity in agriculture, and that's going to cause us a great deal of problems. And these things are probably all true. But it's amazing that nobody said, but at least there'll be less malaria, right? Nobody said that. Mm -hmm. Because we only focus on the things that are going to get worse. And to a certain extent, that's reasonable. Because remember, we have a civilization that's stabilized at exactly the temperature and a lot of other things that we have right now, which is why Finns are not, you know, people from Finland are not very concerned about it being cold, and why, you know, people in Athens or in, in Florida would probably be terrified if it was really cold. And so, you know, you, we, we're, we have a lot of our expenditures focus on, on, on a specific temperature outcome, and any deviation, both uh, colder or warmer, is, is likely to create more problems. But we should also remember is likely to create some fewer problems. And you know, cold is a, is a good example. I'm always astounded in, in Britain, every year in Britain, and this is, these are official figures, uh, uh, about 25,000 people die, somewhere between 25 and 50,000 people die from cold. Every year. Why is that not a news? Because it doesn't happen in one day, right? Whereas a heat wave happens in one day. But these are just simply, they're mostly older people, but that's also true for, 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 for heat deaths, that, you know, that it's cold for a long time and they simply expire sometime before they would otherwise have done. So, but that's still something that ought to outrage us. Uh, there was a, a point uh, two years ago uh, when morgues were about three months behind on, on handing out the bodies because there were so many people dying. Yet I defy, I don't think anyone in this audience uh, heard about that, right? Had this been because of global warming, that would have been a big story, right? But it's not. Uh, and, and in some ways, you could argue that the global warming would probably slightly alleviate that. Now, again, that's not to say that global warming is good. I'm not making that argument. I'm simply pointing out that there's both negatives and positives to global warming, just like there is to pretty much everything else in the world. And we're not well served by only focusing on the negatives. You know, it's enrollment season here at, at Purdue, and we have learned, as other, others have, that um, along with a great academic uh, records and so forth, a, a key quality, if you can identify it, uh, in, uh, in what will make a successful student is, they call it grit, persistence. This audience has shown a lot of grit tonight. It's a, <laughs> therefore, I, I know you're all good learners, and I think we all learned a lot. Through the good offices of our graduate student government, we had another great speaker on campus, Jonathan Rausch, very eminent scholar and writer for a long time. And for 25 or 30 years, one of the earliest, one of the most eloquent and certainly most persistent and courageous advocates of gay rights in the whole country, he gave a wonderful talk about what that march of civil rights was, was like. Um, here are just two lines from Jonathan Rausch, though, that sort of bridge that topic in this one. He's written, a very dangerous principle is now being established as a social right. Thou shalt not hurt others with words. This principle is a menace, and not just to civil liberties. At bottom, it threatens liberal inquiry. That is, science itself. And elsewhere, in liberal science, the community discovers what it thinks through criticism. And its members never do all think any one thing. If they did, intellectual progress would stop. Well, we don't intend that intellectual progress stop at Purdue University. And thanks to Bjorn Lomborg, it took a couple steps forward, I think, uh, tonight. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.